prepare yourself for Earthling Entertainment, the perfect blend of paranormal and pop culture, with your host, Joe Wakefield and Ryan Lamb. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Earthling Entertainment, with Joe Wakefield and Ryan Lang. Hey, I'm the host that was summoned by the witch doctor, Joe Wakefield. And I'm Ryan Lang. Hi. Hi. So, for those of you joining us for the first time, what is Earthling Entertainment? Well, you know what? We what will, is it? We'll tell you what it is. It's a little bit of the spooky, a oh. little bit of the creepy. We start with a segment known as spooky stuff, and that is sometimes cryptozoology or a haunting or a ghost or some other legend, but it's always fun and always spooky. Whoa. That, of course, is followed by... Sorry, that threw me. That was a weird well. <laughs> that, of course, is followed by Disclosure Discussion. That one's all about aliens. I'm just asking questions. UFO stories, videos, photos, anything that we've scrounged up about aliens, We that's what we talk about. Yeah, yeah. Or if a random person makes out with an alien on stage, you bet we'll discuss it. And we will. That's and we have. We have. And then the latter half of the show, the second part, if you will, is all dedicated to pop culture and entertainment. Sometimes movies, video games, music, sometimes it's news, we have interviews, we do games, we talk about celebrity deaths, but it's all pop culture, all entertainment, like I said. So that's the second half, and then the first half is spooky. You put them together, and you know what you get? You get the tasty, delicious moon pie of a podcast known as Earthling Entertainment. Welcome. And thank you for listening. Yes, absolutely. And if you like what you hear today, make sure to download the episode. And if you'd like a free sticker or even two of Earthling Entertainment, all you have to do is email us at earthlingentertainmentpodcast at gmail.com. Sweet. Sweet. So, Ryan, this isn't a sports show, so don't get in too much of the sports stuff. But, but it is being... entertainment. It is entertainment. That's why we're allowing it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll allow it. You went to the uh, the game the because we're in Detroit, so you went to the Lions game, right? Yeah. Last so night. yeah, I went to the the Lions game against the uh, the Seahawks, and uh, Seahawks came over here undefeated, three and zero. Now they are three and one because we won. It was a it was a good game. Uh, you know, I honestly don't know much about sports, to be honest. I, I'm I'm pretty much a new football fan, but my family have all been obsessed with the Lions, so therefore, I just always rooted for the Lions, and they're finally giving us something to watch. Something to root for. There you yeah, go. and speaking of rooting, forgive me if my voice sounds a little shot today, because part of the responsibility of the audience when you're there at a game is you're supposed to get loud, so the other team, when they huddle, they can't hear each other. So... Uh, I, so I was definitely tactic. home field advantage, if you will. Yes, I was I was doing my part and <laughs> I screamed my head off and I woke up today like, oh, yeah, podcast. That was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think everyone will understand. You know, I'm not a sports guy particularly either, but I love live events. I love I go to baseball games. I go to hockey games and it's just fun being around the crowd and seeing something live. I uh, I'm going to a concert on Friday, which I don't go to a lot of concerts just simply because I don't have time. We have a baby and. You know, you got to figure out someone to watch that kid if you're just going to go out. So me and my wife are going to see Fawn, which is... Yeah, a, you showed me that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, uh, I believe they're mainly German, but it's like German, Scandinavian, like folk kind of music. Like pagan folk. Uh, well, their last uh, album was titled Pagan. Well, so, then there you go. See, so, I nailed it. So pretty damn good, right? <laughs> I fucking nailed it. Well, I know that t- type of music. I was really into black metal. Growing up, and there's a lot of like pagan folk black metal bands. And I will stuff. in the lyrics and in yes, totally, but t- completely different music. Because oh is, yeah, this yeah. is more of a like the actual like folky kind of what you would hear. I'm not disparaging black metal at all. No, 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 I'm no. I'm just no. saying. Yeah. <laughs> Don't <laughs> worry, make, they've done that enough. There's themselves. a difference in sound. <laughs> was the only point I was making. Oh, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. No, that and that's great. And uh, but no, I, I hope you guys. I hope you guys have a great time. Uh, I just went to a concert at Pine Knob. I got to see uh, Korn and Gojira. We unfortunately, we, we got a hotel and it was madness because it was sold out. So getting an Uber there was crazy. We literally, we literally talked to a couple of these Canadian dudes at the place and we're like looking on the app and like, oh my God, now it's saying like $70. And the one guy's just like, what a rip off, eh? <laughs> I'm just like, hell yeah, man. And then their, their Uber showed up and I'm like, can we just 
join yours? He's like, oh, sure, eh? So we fucking- Did you give him some money? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. We, they only wanted us to toss in five bucks each. I gave him 10. I was like, here, man. Dude, if, if, if yours was up to 70 already, oh, then you got a great deal. I, 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 I wanted to give him a, I was going to give him a 20, but Canadians are just so damn nice. <laughs> you know what? Out of all the stereotypes, I feel like that's one that no one's going to get mad at us for reinforcing. Fair enough. Canadians do seem nice for the most part. Like, yes. you know, they, they're like, like well, they, they were cool dudes, <laughs> and uh, we got to the show. And uh, the show was great, right? Like, so the band did great, but I have to say, uh, it seemed like there was a technical issue because we were on the lawn and not in the pavilion, right? So we're I like on being the on the lawn, anyways. Except Me too. Uh, I like pan- the freedom. Uh, except Pine Knob, it, it's a hill. Yeah. So you have to be prepared if you're gonna go that you're gonna be like standing on a slant for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so used to it that yeah, it doesn't even phase me. I swear now. Uh, but what I did notice, it was really quiet. Like, usually, even on the hill, it's pretty goddamn loud. Yeah. And like, when we went and saw The Cure there, I, I don't ever mm-hmm. have any memory of the sound not being perfectly adequate. Ex- exactly. And I think all the speakers for the lawn were out. Or there was some weird issue. But it makes no sense. It was a Friday night. It wasn't even that late. So I don't it like. I don't know. Maybe it was a, a, a new sound guy or something, you know? It, whoever it was, he effed up. And I know I'm not the only one who feels this way. I've talked to a lot of people who feel the same way where they're like, dude, am I getting deaf or is this really the... quiet? Yeah. And it was, and here was the telling thing last I'll say about it. Cause the, cause I, I had, we had a friend of ours ask me to talk about it. And I uh, literally the hill was quiet. Like while the bands were playing, like no one was really singing. No one. Cause, cause, cause... everyone wanted to hear the bands. Yeah. That's how I could tell. I'm like, okay, this there's a problem. Like, so, all right, so it, it was a good experience, but a weird experience. Yeah, like because I've never seen corn, so I'm a little jelly. Dude, they, I think I've seen them like three or four <laughs> times. They they always do so great. Corn uh, was the first album I bought. I was in sixth grade, and I bought Freak on a Leash. It's they're just yeah, they're definitely one of my favorites. Totally grew up on corn, but uh, they did a great job. And uh, one thing I couldn't help but think. What do you think, like, I hope someone told the bands that they're having an issue, because from their point of view, maybe they just felt like the crowd wasn't digging the show, because oh, everybody's that would suck. just quiet, right? You're just on stage, you'd be like, oh, fuck, like, you're giving these guys, like, existential crises, they're like, our, I, our careers are over, guys, we're in Detroit Rock City, and no one's giving us, they're not singing along. It's kind of a thing, that's why it's supposed to be loud, it's part of the experience, and, and it's part of... Yeah, it gets you into it. Like, you're not afraid to scream out the words because you're not going to bother anybody. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, fair like, enough. Yeah, you know. Because like, you could clearly hear the music it, over Ryan next to me. Precisely. And well, Ryan well, can project. I was going to say, I was like. Oh. Of course, because you are a metal singer. So you, you're probably a bad example. Well, I, yes, I had years of years and years of beating my fucking voice, voice up being a screamer. But I and I can't I'll, I want to say one more thing about last night. So, yeah, I was screaming last night because. The other people were like, like I felt like Detroit was kind of missing the mark. Like, I found there were so many times where I started people yelling, where I'm like, I'm like, don't let them hear each other. Well, it's like uh, <laughs> once again to jump back to sports. It's like I always wanted to start a wave, right? So I keep trying to do it, and I'm like 10 years old, so no one's joining. Yeah. That's what that reminds me of. But you, yeah. you successfully started chance, so congratulations. Not chance, just just yelling, because you're supposed to just be a constant like, yeah. noise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, I was doing the Gondor yell. <laughs> Duh! Just <laughs> Duh! Oh, man. Oh, but, uh, oh, and one more thing I did want to say about it. Uh, they rocked the new uniforms last night and new helmets that they're going to be wearing now. The The uniforms are black and blue, and they're really freaking cool looking. It was a little weird because <laughs> we, were, we were against a team that was wearing, like, white. And I'm kind of used to picking out our guys wearing white or blue, Holy you know? shit. I thought we were talking about corn. Oh, so no. I'm, a, I'm like, these <laughs> I'm new helmets the and these. Wait a minute. When did we switch, though? Uh, uh, was, when, I was was at all. when I was talking about screaming last night. When I was talking about screaming last night. I was oh. talking about the game. I'm sitting there. I'm thinking, like, is Corn going to do a Slipknot thing? They're all going to wear <laughs> jumpsuits and helmets. They're like, fuck it, guys. This is this is the time to reinvent Corn. I wouldn't even bat an eyelash if they did it. I'd be into it. But no, it's, but no. I was talking about. Sorry, I was talking about the Lions. They've got new helmets, which are really cool looking. 
and uh, not, and yeah, and now they wear uh, black and blue, like mainly black. Oh man, that makes sense because they get trim. beat so often. Oh, not anymore. Well, we are killing it. <laughs> just ju- say, just just wait. <laughs> <laughs> man, I mean, but, I don't know. The Cubs did it eventually. You never know, right? That's true. That's true. You never different know. sport, but same concept. Well, right now we are, uh, I believe, three and one. Like we're doing pretty good. Three wins, one loss. Not too bad. Not too bad. We're doing good. We're doing good. The Lions awesome. are putting on a good show. I know they're favorite. They're favored. Sorry, the last thing. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm done I'm with in, sports. I'm, in, I'm sorry. I'm in, I had a good time last night. I'm glad night. you had a good time, but I, I respectfully say your last piece. <laughs> sports. Sports. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and with that, we'll start the real show with our segment. Like I mentioned in the opening, this is the thing that's a little spooky, a little creepy, a little spooky stuff. Bay kick. The bay kick is one. It's actually Baycock. Oh, see, I was trying to make it sound nicer. <laughs> no, it actually is. I I Googled it like four times to make sure because I knew we would giggle a lot. That's why but, I, yeah, that's no. why I was like, <laughs> I can fix this. No, we are we are mature adults. And it All right. is Baycock. And let me try this one more time then. Baycock. Uh, <laughs> I feel like Beavis Look, it, and Butthead it is. It is in that, that episode. Is, that is the pronunciation according to the internet. So if I'm wrong, <laughs> blame the internet. <laughs> the Baycock is one of the undead. A spirit exists beyond, uh, sorry, a spirit that exists beyond the grave through the sheer force of its supernatural will. The Baycock appears. He's at, kind of a dick. He's sort of a dick. <laughs> The Baycock appears as a skeletal being covered in a translucent layer of dissected skin. Desiccated. Des- desiccated. Gosh, I screwed that one up. <laughs> all good. You you think knowing all the death metal bands I know, I should know that word. Yeah, desiccated. Isn't there, isn't there one band There's with desiccated be. in the name? It just sounds like a death metal band. All right, just start that par- paragraph over. You've got it. The Baycock... <laughs> The Baycock appears as a skeletal being covered in translucent layer of desiccated skin, as well as having a horrifying skull-like countenance. The creature's eyes usually glow an unholy red, although some legends have claimed that the Revenant's eye sockets are empty black pits, soulless and wholly evil. The cries of the Baycock are also described as being shrill. All right, so what's scarier? Like the deep, dark void of nothingness in the eye sockets or like the glowing red? Glowing red. I, I, you know, I'm just not sure, right? It depends, because if it's just like a hole, like the deep dye, the sockets, right? If they're just like a hole, then it's like, oh, you're a skeleton. That's not scary. Exactly. But That's it, where I go, where maybe you can't see me. But if they're, <laughs> if they're talking like, you know, like a black void, like the blackest black. Like black eyes, like a doll's eyes. Oh, there you go. Jaws reference. But exactly, that's the point. I don't know. Red would probably be scarier if they glow. If they're just colored red, if it's just like the tint, then meh. But if they glow, all right, I'll poop a little. Well, that's what I'm saying. (laughs) You just got to assume that it sees you. Oh, my God. Yeah, okay, so that helped. The word bacock. (laughs) I told you. two A's, bacock. You're going to laugh every time. I'm such a child. Just try not to. Oh, gosh. Walk walk with me on this one. In the Anishinaabe language. So Indian tribe, and they were in the Great Lakes area, is my understanding. The Anishinaabe language means skeleton in the sense of bones draped in skin rather than bare bones, such that it lends itself to words like bakakadozo, meaning to be thin skinny or poor and bakak adwenge bakak adwenge meaning to have a lean thin face yeah so basically it's a skeleton with with skin there's hardly any like muscle structure at all it's very 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 skinny right like like a shrink wrap skeleton almost well i mean how else is it good that's always the thing about skeletons. by the way native like, american names and terms are very difficult so do not worry about it just no i'm not worried no <laughs> thank you all for understanding that i am reading holy moly right here uh so the baycock only preys upon warriors 
but does so ruthlessly, using invisible arrows or even beating its prey to death with a club. That's rough. The big cup. Like, you know, and if I can yeah, go my yeah. whole life without being beaten with a club, I'll call it a win. Yeah, oh, that, that's a total win. The, the baycock, after paralyzing or killing its prey, then devours the liver of its victim. And that, that actually tracks. Mm, nom, 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 nom. Got the onions? Well, the, yeah. Well, the liver is like the most nutritious part of the body. A lot, I believe wolves like go for that first. That like, can't like, be like right. That. I, I, I swear to God. I, I have no information, but the liver filters out all the toxins and shit from your blood, right? Right. So how could that be the most nutritionist? Excuse me, nutritionist. How could be the most nutritious part of the body? That can't be right. I on it. I want to say I've listened to enough like weird podcasts that I I believe that to be true. So that is the extent of my knowledge. Okay, so you, <laughs> I'm gonna say we're gonna leave it at you believe it to be true, and I have no idea. So continue. Liver, the baker. Skeptical. <laughs> oh, are we skeptical? Okay, ready. Here we go. I am ready. Let's talk more about the baker. I love this name. The Baycock is a hunter, stalking and killing human prey without a hint of guilt or remorse. However, this- It would actually be kind of better if it had guilt. It would be funny if it just walked around and killed I'm people sorry. and then just got so upset about it. I'm so but sorry. The, but then he kept doing it, right? Like he walks by, <laughs> oh God, I did it again. Why do I do this? Oh, I hate myself. All right, but I'm still going to keep killing you, but I'm really sorry about it. <laughs> like, oh, this is why people don't invite you to parties, I'm Baycock. I'm getting the club. <laughs> just, just, every time we're hitting somebody in the face with a club, like, invisible, sorry. Invisible error. Oh, I'm terrible. Invisible error. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like the Thunderbolt guy, but with invisible error. <laughs> fireball. Fireball. <laughs> fireball. Lightning bolt. All right, we're done. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I still think that would be fucking hilarious, though. Yeah. Like, it's just literally just depressed all the time as it, like, <laughs> is just just beating people. And it's, like, it's so remorseful. So you think it's, like, not going to do it. But then you walk up to it. It just stabs you oh, in it's the going, face. Oh, it's going to do it. And it's like, oh, I did it again. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's that's just really funny to me. Oh, Baycock. However. Baycock. Dun, 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 dun. Next week on I'm Kind of a Dick. <laughs> Leave it to Baycock. Oh, that that's better. That's better. By the way, uh, the name of this episode is going to be Baycock and Broomsticks. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Bed knobs. Yep. However, this ghoulish creature never appears to more than one individual at a time. And He's fucking shy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess so. Only preys upon hunters and warriors. The Baycock prefers to hunt at night, moving silently through brush in the darkness in search of lone individuals. Okay, by all of these Buddy dis- system. By <laughs> fair enough. Uh, by all of these descriptions, it sounds like a misidentified predator from the movie Predator. So far, yeah. So, so far, <laughs> it is said that the only way to sense an impending attack is by hearing the popping and creaking sounds made by the creature's bones. And even sensing the threat is no guarantee of survival. Although, the Baycock occasionally uses a heavy war club to bludgeon its victims to death, the creature prefers a bow that fires invisible arrows, which are tipped with a poison that induces a deep, dreamless sleep in those hit by the arrows. So at least it's peaceful. Well, they just get knocked out. There's like... And you don't even dream. So it's just like, all right. Isn't that death? I don't know. Let's see. In this state, which lasts several hours, the unfortunate victim cannot feel any pain. Oh, my God. This feels very rapey. All all the better for the Baycock. Now, come on. We can turn another Baycock into a rapist. So all the better for the Baycock, it says here, as it can now feast. So it just eats you, Joe. Put your mind out the gutter. (laughs) <laughs> Before it eats, the Baycock unsheathes a small silver knife and slices open the victim's abdomen. <laughs> the revenant then thrusts in its bony hand, right. removes right, the look, liver. Look, look. I don't want to piss anyone off, 
But this is sounding really Bill Cosby. It's really creepy. I'm just saying. I don't like it. He's like, oh no. Dude, the Baycock has really gone down a road here. I, <laughs> like, we didn't want to go down this there's road. Like, there's like a, a, a Reddit Stippy documentary called Happy Happy Joy Joy. And the whole fucking three quarters of the movie is just like, oh cool, it's this guy. And he makes a cartoon and he's kind of like weird. And then like the third act, they're just like, and he might fuck kids oh my god you're like oh no (laughs) why did we take this left turn this is horrible dude like this story may i I feel like this episode may may have gone too far continue that's okay we're going off the rails a little today people and that's all right i'm gonna repeat this this paragraph here we go before it eats the Baycock unsheathes a small silver knife and slices open the victim's abdomen the revenant then thrusts in its bony hand, removes the liver, and greedily consumes the organ. After dining, the Baycock shoves a rock into the empty cavity. All better. And <laughs> finishes by sewing the wound shut with a magic thread that heals any and all superficial signs of the incision. Okay. So you just go to get an x-ray and you have <laughs> a, rock. a rock instead of a fucking liver? That's kind of awesome. Hold on, though. This goes back to it being very remorseful spirit. Where it's like, oh, God, I did it again. Sorry. I, I can fix it. I can fix it. I can fix it. Oh, shh, shh, it's all fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. This, this will work. I have all a better. medical degree. All better now. <laughs> I'll just put a rock there. That That's fine. That's like a liver. Yeah, you'll be fine. It is fine. fine. The unsuspecting victim then wakes up the next morning in the middle of the woods, most often with no recollection of their encounter with the ghoulish Baycock. Yeah, it's like a bathtub full of ice story, except it's a fucking supernatural creature. Or a date rape drug. Surprisingly. I wasn't unfortunate... going to go back down that I wasn't going to go back down that road. I'm just saying the Baycock's a jerk. Surprisingly, the unfortunate individual often lives for days or even weeks without any adverse side effects despite having unknowingly lost a vital organ. Then the victim (laughs) suddenly becomes violently sick, inevitably wasting away and dying. There are no exceptions. Fortunately. Except the guy who went to the doctor and he's like, there's a rock in there, dude. Like, well, maybe that would be written up in a medical journal. Can you imagine being the doctor who get to be the person who removed a rock that was mysteriously replaced someone's organ? Well, I mean, and you would be famous. You'd be well, like Doctor House and from that would, show House. In in medical <laughs> books, forever there would be the story of one <laughs> doctor who found a person who, by some means, his liver turned into a rock. Right, and we will all just think that that can happen. No, a hundred years later, two hundred <laughs> years later, they won't. They'll be like, they'll be like, we don't understand what they meant, but clearly he wasn't referring to an actual rock. It was an allegory for kidney stones. And, and then, so, and then we. Should show up and we're like dudes it was the baycock why in that scenario did i imagine us as bill and ted like right like <laughs> <laughs> most excellent guys whoa listen it's the baycock it's totally. this native american devil spirit who's like not really remorseful about ripping you open and taking your liver eating it and replacing it with a rock but you know that's what happened excellent if you guys follow that See you later. And then we just hop back into the phone booth and take off. Good. Good. You and know, then we so and then we solve that forever. And then we find the Baycock and then they're in zoos. And then they're in zoos. Uh I always wanted a, a, a to do a story about like a cryptozoology zoo, right? That would be cool. Yeah. I like that idea. That'd be that'd be a good tattered. It tales. would end up being kind of Jurassic Parky though, you know, because what else could you make that story about if not they all break out? Well, of course. Yeah. Like a little bit of that, a little bit of thirteen ghosts. <laughs> Kind of thing. Oh, oh I can see bit. that. So, back to the Baycock. Fortunately, the Baycock never willingly approaches a human civilization, as the creature itself is extremely reluctant to leave the safety of the forest. The Baycock knows its forest domain better than a seasoned woodsman, using this knowledge to set ambushes to attract prey without being detected in turn. <clears throat> Excuse me. In turn, and to escape those that may be hunting it. The Baycock inhabits the forest territories of the Great Lakes. Ooh, that's why we're doing it. That's locals here. Especially if these places were once inhabited inhabited by...
by the Chippewa, which was, yeah, that was there was a lot of Chippewa here. Although a skeleton, the Baycock retains the same degree of strength as it possessed during its lifetime, probably through mystical means. The creature is far more agile and much quicker than it was in life, being free from the limitations of heavy muscle and flesh. To make matters worse, the Baycock is impervious to most weapons and attacks, including blades or firearms. In addition, the Baycock is highly proficient with the bow and arrow and is skilled in use with its war club. I got a sound. It sounds like you don't want to face off with this guy. Dude, it sounds like a bad guy in Skyrim. I mean, it's just like, all right, so this weird little skeleton sack thing just jumps around. So it's as strong as it was in life, but it's faster and it's more agile now. And basically, they I mean, I'm sure they're going to tell us some way to defeat it, but it sounds like most weaponry isn't a good idea. I guess explosions, right? If you blow something up, they're they're blown up. I mean, they're they're dead. Most of the time, it's not like movies where ten thousands parts come out and reform to recreate it, right? Yeah, yeah. You put so it... hypothetically, if you manage to shove a grenade into its rib cage, I was thinking that or down its throat. Right, right. I'm talking. I'm thinking third act. You know, battle. How do we do? How do we defeat this thing? Just like put a hand grenade in its mouth and then just duct tape it real quick. <laughs> that, that feels like a mix between like Scooby Doo and like Saw, but yeah, why not? <laughs> so, one of the most horrifying aspects of the Baycock is that the creature has no known weaknesses. Holy water, religious icons, and perhaps even blessed weapons have no effect on this revenant. I'm however, just, it sounds like you're just screwed. However, like most of the corporal undead, the Baycock may have some sort of susceptibility to fire. That makes sense. Because you burn anything. Nothing wants to be burnt. And you turn it to ash. It, there's, it's hard to come back from that. I mean, yeah. yeah. And I mean, yeah, fire to corpse. I yeah, mean, yeah. you're pretty dried out. You'd imagine that's not going to go well. I have like three different urns in my house right now of ashes of dead people. And if we could bring them back, I've got some questions. Because they've been in the room when I've said some terrible things. And I'm worried that if they come back, they're going to report me. Follow it on our next segment. <laughs> talking with the dead. I was trying to think of like how to like continue talking to make that story seem less weird. And I feel like I got to be. Eh, we, I've been talking to the dead. Me and my girlfriend play on a Ouija board. We've been oh, doing it. Fair enough. Fuck, tell, it, tell me if you accidentally unleash something crazy and like your lights start flashing or like dishes we, are flying out. We may or may not have summoned Zozo, which is like the. Well, Pazuzu is from Exorcist. There was like Zozo, who's like the. Like you can look it up. It's like an urban dictionary thing. And it's. Uh, if I got the name wrong, sorry. But That's all right. It's, if it's this like is... a demon of a Ouija. Like it's literally an Ouija board demon. Okay, well, you know what? If this is uh, the first act in a horror film and you are about to go on a very horrible adventure, <laughs> uh, fill us in next week. Yeah, I was going to say, you heard it first here. <laughs> so, yeah, if I die, you know, it was, it was Zozo or whatever it was. But uh, we said goodbye. We did all the rules right. So, should be straight. Well, if nothing weird's happened since then, you're probably fine. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You got cancer, Ryan. <laughs> you have can Dude, yeah, I just showed Joe Meat Canyon. He has never heard of it before. Back to the <laughs> Back Baycock. Back to the Baycock. I'm not going to endorse that cartoon. <laughs> My bad. And since this Revenant is little more than a dried up skeleton, some sort of bludgeoning attack is advisable. If a fight is unavoidable. Yeah, so you, just set up a trap. Get like a giant boulder to fall on it. Yeah, just like crumb, crush them. Yeah, yeah. yeah oh my God, bones. it's like the little turtle skeletons from freaking Mario. Yeah. All we got to do is jump on their heads, Bo. Eat, they got just it. crumble. They might come back up. They might well, they come do, back up. They do, they do, yeah. But you can jump on them. You got to destroy and the then head. then you get away. Right, right. And it's also like in Breath of the Wild and you know, all that stuff. Like whenever you kill like the, the skeleton dudes, you got to kill the head or else they come back. Learned a lot from here. Yeah. It'd be amazing if any of these weird things that were in video games or pop culture actually worked against a supernatural creature. Like, just so happens. I mean, that's going to be all the future soldiers. Like, everybody's going to be like, I learned this shit in Call of Duty. Well, I, rem <laughs> I remember this story where this, uh, this girl, I think she was like nine years old. I'm not sure about her exact age. But basically, uh, she, there was a car accident, and the car flipped over. And she got her, like, parents out or convinced everyone to get away from the car. 
uh, before it exploded because she played Grand Theft Auto and she knew that when cars flipped over, they explode. And while obviously that's not true under every it circumstance, just to that work. just was how it turned out for this story. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ender's Game, right? They use video games basically to train kids to um, do war. I think they're doing that now because of drone pilots. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I mean, hell, Gran Turismo is a simulator for driving, and there are people who played Gran Turismo so much, they became professional race car drivers because of it. Oh. Yeah, there's an actual... They, if you look at the Gran Turismo movie, it's about that, and, and then you, I looked it up because I was curious, and that's like a true story. I mean, you know as far as movies are concerned. But the fact is the a sim as a video game simulator was enough to get these guys to be able to actually be race car drivers. Like that is legit. That happened. That's fucking sick. But so, uh, so anyone who says the ends of Snakes on a Plane where Keenan Thompson <laughs> lands the plane because he's been playing a flight simulator the whole movie, which by the way, we all should have seen fucking coming. Anyone who says that ending doesn't make sense, you're just simply wrong. Way to be wrong, bro. Back to the Baycock. <laughs> and it even says here, so, you know, the bludgeoning attack, like it was saying, uh, it says here, use the creature's own war club for this if necessary. So if you can, there's a way to wrestle his club from him. See, so that feels like a video game again. All right, so yeah. you get its weapon and then you can beat it to death. Yeah. So since the Baycock is clinically dead, one cannot actually kill the creature. However, despite what legends say, there may be a way to destroy it. It may be necessary to hunt down the Baycock to its lair deep in the forest, confront it, and break its brittle bones to splinters with a heavy bludgeon. A mace works best. Okay, so, <laughs> I mean, this started out where it was sounding like this thing is impenetrable, but it's like, no, 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 it's not. You just have to, like, beat it. This down. seems like a how-to book. Yeah, right? like Like, how to destroy your Baycock. Pesky no, they, Baycocks. They were a problem before we published this book. Then, the remains should be gathered up and placed in a pile of dry wood, and then thoroughly soaked in gasoline or lighter fluid. Then a lit match. As the Indians did. Right. <laughs> then a lit match should be thrown onto the pile, igniting it. The fire should be constantly fed until nothing remains of the Baycock except for ashes. If luck holds out, this should permanently destroy the creature and prevent it from ever rising again. However, be aware that this is only a theory and has never actually been tested. Then why was it so specific? This is how you do it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> is, is like <laughs> just say it. I'm pretty sure this would work. We're just asking questions. <laughs> so the Baycock is one of the uh, the Baycock is one of the undead again. A being that has died but maintains a semblance of life by drawing sustenance from the living. This ghoul originates from Chippewa myths and legends. Although this harbinger of doom has been encountered by the Ojibwa and the Algonquin yeah, Indians that, no, as well. That was pretty good. I know it is Algonquin for sure. Uh, among these people, the Baycock is an unstoppable killer stalking and murdering people without a trace of remorse <laughs> as opposed to sorry i was gonna say so we've got different sorry. uh no 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 they they've always said there was no remorse i was the one saying they oh. were remorseful <laughs> i don't know why yours just stuck with me more because i was very animated you were <laughs> you are the baycock's origins aren't completely understood even to this day however some evidence suggests that the Baycock may once have been a proud hunter and a fearless warrior. One day he was out hunting, but his quarry led him far, far off the game trail. Eventually, not only did he lose his prey, but he became hopelessly lost as well. Several days later, on the verge of death from starvation and angry at being deprived of the privilege to enjoy his life and the glory that he felt he was due to be given, the hunter swore that his life force would never leave his remains. 
sometime after his body had decomposed. He was roused from his eternal sleep by hunters. Angered and vengeful, the hunter arose from his unmarked grave as the baycock, craving the flesh of man. Thus, the baycock came to be, and legend says that the creature still roams the forests, always hunting for its next victim. Like a gangster. Uh, don't fuck with the Bangkok. 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 So I, I don't know. I like the one. I um, I was just surprised that I found a Native American myth I hadn't heard of because it Same. was it was in the Great Lakes area, and it's like Same. And yeah, yeah. Chippewa Indians. Like I know a, a little bit about that. I was gonna so. say that's our Indian. Like like that's that's our. Where we live, we we were born and raised here in Michigan, Joe and I. Yeah, you know, yeah. like in fact, I was told that I was about twenty five percent Chippewa Indian, like uh, legitly, like from my family and my father's side, stuff like that. Turns out it's not true at all. At, at <laughs> I remember my, you saying that. My like, and I said this my whole life. Like I confidently was like, I am Native American, partly. I was. I'm twenty five percent victim, um, <laughs> as South Park would put it. The, it was just so messed up because uh, my sister did a 23 and me and I was like 32 and they're like, oh, yeah, you totally have Native American. You uh, have 2%. And I'm like, that's still. No, no, you can't be 2% of anything and claim it. That is that is no, 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 no. I mean, you're I not have, gonna, like you're not going to claim it. I have I mean, a it's... lot of respect for the Native American people and I am sorry for misrepresenting. <laughs> oh, no. Dude. Well, I mean, it's still something to be proud of. You know, it's still part of your shit. Like, I am proud of who I am. It's just what I am. I think I had apparently like... Irish, German and uh, English. So a uh, European mutt. Nothing, unfortunately, nothing special. <laughs> I'm like British as hell, yeah. then Irish, then German. And I have like, I'm like the same as you. Like I have like 2% finish. Where well, it's like, I still can't help but be like, that's kind of key. Yeah, like, well, you know, exactly. Because like, you're, because you're like Vikings. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's very similar thing. Very, where it's very like, smart. where it's like, you could not really. And it, you know what should have tipped me off? My last name is Wakefield. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe I'm I'm from the English or Wales area, you know. Like maybe, maybe obviously. My last name being Lang, I assume has to be German. It sounds German. I could be wrong. I don't know. I don't know. I never really looked into it though. I just <laughs> for some reason I always associated you with being Irish. I just thought you were like Irish mm. all the way. Uh, my clan is Sullivan. So I know that's... that that's my German. My 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 Irish name. My German name is Bernstein. I did look that up. Your German name is Bernstein. I know. So my my assumption is uh, we probably didn't come over here on the greatest of terms. Fair enough. We were what? probably running away from some shit. That way, sounds, way, that sounds, way, yeah. way, way back down the line because I that's the first I've heard of anything like that. Yeah, I know. My my parents figured it out. My dad did. And I was like, Bernstein. It's weird. I want to know if I have anything fun in my background, but it's like I like my kid will know that because my wife and my wife's father keeps a lot of records and nice. like uh so he's 25% Spanish because she's half because the mom was full. And uh, she actually has dual citizens, uh, dual citizenship in Spain. That's cool. Yeah. So, uh, like, he has some actual links to some, like, history because, like, his great – at this point, it would be his great-grandfather, I believe uh, – was like a pilot in the Spanish military and like was friends with Dang. the king, I believe. Whoa. Or the prime minister. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know the governmental structure in Spain. But Neither do I. The it's head okay. of state at that time. That's cool. Yeah. No. So, it, yeah. No. So it's like, but it's like, as far as the Wakefields are concerned, um, damn, dude, my family apparently d they were apparently fibbers because once again, I thought I was 25 percent Native American. Oh well, yeah, and uh, you know, every every now and then, who knows? Like uh, supposedly. We have like an uh, a relative. This last I'll talk about it before the next one is we evidently have a relative that was nicknamed Grandma Hot Pants because like oh way God. long ago, like evidently like she was a little uh, loosey goosey, and uh, so for all we know, literally we looked it back. My last name could actually be from Kruger from well, Chicago. Weird, isn't that crazy? Like we've done a lot of work in my family looking back on the stuff. Like it's crazy, huh? 
Well, I'll be dumb. Anyways. Anyways. We have uh, an additional spooky stuff this week, and it's a very short one. That's why it's just a, it's a tag on, if you will, but it's a fun little cryptid. It, it's not enough to have an, a whole episode dedicated to it, but it's worth a mention. And it literally popped up in my Google feed, and I was just like, oh, this is sweet. And then Joe's like, there's like two paragraphs. I'm like, oh, well, let's do it. The Bar Guest. The bar guest in folklore of northern England, especially Yorkshire. A monstrous goblin dog with huge teeth and claws that appears only at night. It was believed that those who saw one clearly would die soon after, while those who caught only a glimpse of the beast would live on, but only for some months. The demon of Tidworth, the black dog of Winchester, the Padfoot of Wakefield, Woo! the Barghast of Barnley, are all related apparitions. And how creepy is that, that it's got your name? And it, and it well, up Wakefield is a place. That's crazy. Yeah. So there you go. That's where you're from. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, there's a Wakefield, Michigan, <laughs> right, too. I'm kidding. So. <laughs> there, nope, nope. Figured it out. Nope, that's, that's it. Found it. There's your fucking Hobbiton, bro. Yeah, right. You rewrite the books now. Their Welsh counterparts were red-eyed Gwilji, the dog of darkness, and Quin Anwin, the dogs of hell. That feels very elfy. It does, yeah, that was very elfish. Quin Anwin. Yeah, it was. You're right. In Lancashire, the monster was called Trash. Scrike. That's kind of mean. Just Scrike, trash? Yeah, just Trash. Oh. Scriker or Striker. It's broad sometimes backward pointing feet made in a... kentucky it's known as a dick <laughs> <laughs> and it made us their feet made a splashing noise and it howled horribly in east anglia anglia sorry where it was thought to be amphibious the dog had only one eye and was known as black shuck or shock it was called the mouth duke on the Isle of Man. The Manchester bar guest was said also to be headless. All right, well, see- We've got a lot of things going on here. Yeah, it kind of always confuses me when there's so many wildly different descriptions, but they're like, no, it's the same creature. But like, okay, but that one's like amphibious and has one eye. That one over there is headless. And the other one has backwards feet that makes blushy sounds. Exactly. And and they're all supposedly the same black dog that if you see it, it foretells the coming doom, right? Isn't that it? Like you're going to die is kind of the central thing if you see it. Yeah, right. It, yeah. If you see it, you're dead immediately. Didn't, and wasn't this in Harry a, Potter? I think so. If you catch it, but it says there's no surviving. Even if you just catch a glimpse of the thing, uh, you die within months. Oh, man. It's like Bird Box. Yes. Oh. I actually, yeah, I want to re. That's funny you mentioned that. I was thinking about rewatching that movie because yeah. there was a lot going on in that movie. Yeah, do you know they made a sequel? No. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's a sequel. It could be a remake that's just Spanish language. I'm not sure, but it's uh, Bird Box Barcelona. They should have just called it Bird Boxes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, like I said, I just saw it passing through the Netflix queue, so I'm not 100. percent I didn't. I didn't really look into it that much, but I think it's a sequel. That just, you know, the same phenomenon happening, but what what people in Barcelona do to deal with it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, so when it comes to, to this creature, I thought it was really funny it popped up, but uh, who knows? Maybe it's just a, uh, you know, a case of mistaken identity. It could just be some kind of wretched creature in the forest that's maybe just like some mangy coyote or something. Who knows? But... I don't know. And the guy a... just happened to slip and hit his head and die from an aneurysm like three days later. It's, it's possible. Anything could happen. and Or it could be a headless, backward-footed, splooshing foot. Amphibian. Amphibian with one eye that happens For some to... reason, we still call a dog. There you go. And they, and they, well, and did we ever think that maybe we just hurt their feelings? Like these, they called them trash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the real reason why these things are killing us is insults from the humans. Well, I mean, yeah, it's kind of like the Splink. We did the Splink, and that thing was just, like, super sad. So, like, who knows? Some of these cryptids have feelings. The they the have Splink feelings, too, Joe. Squanch. It was the Squanch, the, right? Was it the Squanch? No, Squanch is from Rick and Morty. <laughs> <laughs> Can I Squanch? 
Oh my god! Mind that, if I go squatch? That is kind of the problem with doing a show that's all like paranormal and pop culture. Is occasionally things do get blended in my head a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Though. That was a good mix-up. I'm yeah, a fan. It's fun. Uh, so I yeah. think that brings us to the end of spooky stuff, dude. That is the end of spooky stuff. So let's just jump into our next segment, which is all about aliens, and we call it. Disclosure discussion. Ha 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 ha! It's about aliens and stuff. The UFO abduction of Whitley Stryber while he was writing sci fi. Ooh. This comes to us from allthatsinteresting.com. So, uh, this guy is a sci fi writer. There was a movie made about him. Uh, Christopher Walken plays him. And he is like a science fiction guy who actually got abducted by aliens and is wrote a real life book about it. The aliens. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. They were little guys. I, I do a terrible, terrible impersonation of him. Whitley Stryber has written fiction for more than eight, 40 years with notable titles including the horror novels The Wolfen and The Hunger. Stryber contends that his writing streak was interrupted one night in the late 80s by an alien abduction in upstate New York. Stryber recounted this experience in his nonfiction title, Communion, in 1987. The alleged incident occurred on the night of December 26, 1985, as Stryber slept alone in his cabin in the woods. Allegedly. Well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> he actually slept with this guy named Gary. Not sexually. He was just in the same room in a cot next to it. But we don't talk about Gary. Yeah, like we do. I don't know. I just... <laughs> <laughs> Woken by a strange noise, he per- purportedly saw a small non-human entity approaching his bed. So, suddenly, it was morning. Not only had he awoken disoriented, but he felt oddly aggressive, too. It was during a session of regressive hypnosis a few months later that some of the memories returned. According to Stryber, beings that he has since referred to as visitors entered his home and abducted him. While seen as a work of fiction added to his catalog of alien stories by many, Stryber never wavered from his position. In fact, His later work only doubled down on the notion that aliens were visiting him. In his book, The Key, A True Encounter, Stryber detailed another alien encounter that he claims took place in Toronto. Asleep in his Delta Chelsea hotel room in the middle of the night on June 6, 1998, Stryber claimed to have been visited by another mysterious stranger. Quote, I got up to open the door thinking it was the room service waiter, Stryber recalled. It was not. It was a man I described as about five and a half feet tall, older looking, like someone in his 70s. He wore a dark colored clothing, a turtleneck, and charcoal slacks, unquote. Stryber claimed the visitor stood motionless by the window for nearly an hour, Founding on the dangers of creating an intelligence more evolved than its creator. Stryber said, It was the most extraordinary conversation I have ever had in my life. Many are skeptical of Stryber's alien abduction claims, but one former Green Beret commander and developer of weapons at Los Alamos, New Mexico, John B. Alexander, believes him. He says, quote, For more than two decades, I have been interacting with Whitley Stryber and found him to be one of the most intelligent and thoughtful researchers in the field, said Alexander. There is no doubt that he has had some very strange experiences, ones that even he does not claim to fully understand, and and that I do respect. I do respect it, too. I mean, that that is a military man who's, like, staking his reputation on believing him. Oh yeah, we I, need we need these guys. We do. I just I also feel a little skeptical, and I don't mean to. It's just the bottom line is this guy wrote science fiction. There is that. So he's one able to come up with these stories. So right off the bat, he has the ability. But also, it's more of even if it was innocent, 
he says he went to sleep when these encounters happened. So it's like, could it be a dream? Well, of course it could be a dream. And is his imagination powerful enough to create such a narrative? Absolutely it is. He is a fiction writer. Uh, you know, so it's like, that's why it's hard, particularly for me to believe. It's the same reason why, uh, no, <laughs> I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but L. Ron Hubbard writes all these science fiction novels, and then he writes a book, and that one particular book is considered fact to Scientologists. And oh, base, well, yeah. And they base a whole religion on it, and he is a science fiction writer, right? So that's the same way I'm like, that doesn't feel credible, is almost the same way I feel like this is not, I don't know. I want to believe it. I liked the movie. I read the book, and I liked the book. Um... His, there's a lot of... Ah. I'm reminded of those little mummified aliens, supposed to remember. It was happening down in Mexico. And the guy was known to literally be a like a dude who makes these kind of things like, for look, like, look, movies. Guys, like I, he's an artist. <laughs> I know I make fake shit for a living, but this this is real. And the world like fell for it. Like uh, twice. Like we went through that twice with this guy. So that's what I'm reminded of with, with you know what I mean? But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying jury's out. Uh, that being said, I'll agree with that. To be clear, I do personally, like all jokes aside, I do personally believe in aliens. I think that there is plenty of universe out there and it's silly to think that there's not a population of intelligent beings somewhere else. I, uh, I'm not sure how often they visit earth, but I do think at some point it is logical that they may have. And it would explain some weird mysteries in our history and some experiences people claim to have had. So I'd say I'm very open to the idea of all the UAP UFO phenomenon happening now and today. And I'd say as far as aliens, I absolutely believe they exist. So this starts our next segment, Mysteries in Our Histories. Ba, 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 they already have that. It's called Ancient Aliens. <laughs> But I just love the name. You said that in it's your good. in your rant there, and I was just like, ooh. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Next segment. So, yes, bring the, brings us to our next article here. Of Which, uh, to be clear, discussion. yeah, another disclosure. The alien abduction of Antonio Villas Boas that ended in extraterrestrial coitus. In 1954, two Venezuelan teenagers claimed that they found a UFO in the woods and were only able to escape with their lives after fighting off small, hairy aliens. Bra <laughs> Brazilian <laughs> journalist... Oh, boy. I, I Forgive me if this is wrong. Just I'm just going to say Ho Joao Martins covered the alleged experience in 1957. He asked readers to send... And he asked readers to send in their own experience. That's when he was contacted by farmer Antonio Villas Boas. Martins paid for the 23-year-old's travel expenses and put him up in Rio de Janeiro, where Dr. Olavo Fontes examined him. Boas claimed that he was that he experienced an alien abduction one day after reading Martin's article chronicling the Venezuela incident, which seemed rather convenient. Boas said he had been working nights in the family's field in order to avoid the hot daytime temperatures. On October 16, 1957, he purportedly saw a red star above the fields near Seo Francisco de Sales. As it approached, Boas claimed that atop the egg-shaped craft was a cupola containing a rotating red light. As the vessel extended its three legs to the earth, Boaz claimed that he tried to flee, but he was captured by five-foot-tall beings wearing gray overalls and helmets and then taken aboard their ship. It was the members of CORE. <laughs> Dude, I'm like really thinking, there we go. Boaz alleged <laughs> that the beings' eyes were blue. Oh, so they're, they're from, uh, from Dune. What was it, right? Didn't they have blue eyes? Yes, because of uh, all the spice that they That's right. ingested and just were around all the time. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Which also means they're probably a bit psychic, just saying. What was the name for it, for the spice? What was the... 
I, it, I think it's just Spice. No, no, they have a name. The spice. They did. Uh, the Spice Must Flow. Yeah. I can't remember the name. I don't. South Park something did the miage. thing. Something miage. Yeah. The, the, the Dumiage or something, something weird. I unfortunately do not know. The Fremen. I know they were the Fremen. The, they were the Fremen. So the, so the Fremen's eyes were blue. I'm kidding. The, the being's eyes were blue and small, and their communication consisted of animal-like sounds. After blood was taken from his chin, Boaz was purportedly placed into a room filled with a strange gas that caused him to feel severely ill. Soon, a naked and attractive female entered the room. Boaz claimed the woman was adorned with long blonde hair and red pubic hair, and that the two soon engaged in sex. Uh, we don't get to get too much into detail, but what a weird thing to comment on. Yes. Right? Like, I noticed that she was Lady Redbush. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, the woman gestured to her stomach, then motioned upwards. With a thumbs up. Which, which <laughs> Boas later nailed it, bro. <laughs> uh, yeah, which Boas later interpreted to mean that he was the man. No, I'm kidding. Later to mean that she would raise their child in space. Maybe. Yes. Yes. He interpreted that. She was like, "No, now we can be a family together." And he's like, "Well, back, yeah. get back to Earth." Uh, I'm gonna go get a pack of smokes. Be right back. Listen, when Maury calls, just tell me. <laughs> But Bo- Boaz claimed he felt angry at having been treated like a good stallion like by a the beings. Dirty, dirty man whore. I'm not just a piece of meat. Listen, you aliens, you come up and you seduce me, and then you just leave me for nothing. I can't think of a way to make that funny. It just got sad. It was sad. Really, really sorry for this guy. He you know was... what? I take it back. I'm on his side. That's right. He's the victim, clearly. That's right. He was subsequently taken off the ship and watched it ascend to the heavens. Four hours had passed since his abduction. I'm sick of these fucking aliens just hitting and quitting. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? This is, this is, this is a weird episode. It is a weird one. That's okay. Though both Martins and Dr. Fontes believed the story was fabricated. The doctor noticed signs that Boa had radiation sickness, such as nausea and bruising, burning sensations of the eye, and skin that was painful to the touch. Boas later became a successful lawyer who created models of the UFO from his story in his spare time. While Walter Bueller of the Brazilian ufology group SBEDB visited him in 1962 and published a report on his story, it still remains unproven. Boas died in 1991, but his intriguing alien story lives on. All right, I would, I, we were joking and stuff, but I mean, if he actually had some kind of radiation poisoning, like radiation doesn't come from nothing. So clearly something happened. Now, was he abducted by aliens or maybe he was abducted by a government agency? I have no idea. Maybe... But something clearly happened. You don't just get radiation poisoning. I agree. And I have to actually agree with kind of the point that you were jumping on there was like, you never really hear this kind of story with a poor guy. Like, yeah, like, so, you know, being a normal, it's like, wait a minute, like, we are made a kid? Well, I mean, obviously, you want to be there for your kid if, you know, usually. I would, I, I, I'm, I'm nothing but questions, right? Like that, like, what an odd position to be in. I agree. Like, no, that was a different spin. Like, you don't often hear that point where it's like, wait a minute. They like, like, because think of it, like, you couldn't do that the other way around. You couldn't just, like, get a woman <laughs> pregnant. You could just show up to an alien planet, get her pregnant, and leave without any consequences. Where, you know, like, <laughs> they're going to find you. <laughs> like, she's, <laughs> they, he's saying. Just, just stop. Just stop. We're Ace done. Mature, Ace Mature, too. He's, what's that he's saying? He's saying she's not a virgin. They could tell that. <laughs> and then just him running. Running through the... <laughs> <sighs> you know what's really, really kind of sad about the uh, Ace Ventura series? What? They did have a third one. 
yeah, the kid. But Ace it was like Ventura Jr. And it like ruined like the older guy's career that was in it, right? Not the kid, like obviously not the kid. I don't know if the kid even had a career. I don't know that, what but... older guy you're talking about. Wasn't there? I thought that there was like a, a father figure or an adult that was kind of a, a supporting lead. Maybe I have. No I never memory. saw it. No, I just like, know that I saw you're things. Just saying pulling that it information wrong. out of the ether, I maybe I don't know. Yeah, and I I saw that. Yeah, it was just it was such a stinker that it it, it made getting roles for him pretty hard after that. Earthling Entertainment Special Report. Megalopolis unsurprisingly bombs at the box office, making only $4 million on its opening weekend. <laughs> only. DC Studios is developing a Batman spin-off featuring Bane and Deathstroke. Oh, stroke me to death. Wild Robot's tomato reading for the audience score is like the best in DreamWorks animation history. Prepare to cry. And that has been a Earthling Entertainment Special Report. Ow. Music Bumbles. What really happened to Sonny Boy Williamson? This comes to us from Far Out Magazine. This is a story that only gets stranger as it unfolds. At the age of 34, blue star Sonny Boy Williamson's life was tragically cut short. In 1948, after a performance at Chicago's Plantation Club, he met a mysterious death just at, sorry, he met a mysterious death just a block and a half from his home. Despite having a national hit song, Shake That Boogie. Shake That Boogie. I don't know if that's a sound. Know, on that rhythm and blues chart at the time, his murder remained enigmatic. The official police report indicated robbery and assault. But fellow musician William Billy Boy Arnold claimed to know the true story. According to Arnold, Williamson had won a significant sum of money from dangerous gamblers at, the, at an after-hours gathering, leading to an altercation that resulted in his death. The details surrounding his murder remain concealed or vague, prompting questions about its authenticity. Even when his death notice appeared the next day in the Jackson Sun, there existed no mention of his impact or musical career. All of this begs the question, was his real cause of death deliberately concealed by the establishment? Dun, 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 dun. I can't even speculate, but it's always fun to have a mystery. There's a surprising amount, uh, amount of musicians that just got like disappeared. Yeah, you and you, you never know. There, there's, It was a whole industry, and... Uh, there were creepy guys with cigars behind the, de the desks. <laughs> the smoking man. You know what I'm saying? There was always like, yeah. You're going to make it, kid. You're going to do it, kid. We'll find a way to make money off you somehow. Come on in, dear boy. Have a cigar. You're going to go far. Sorry, Pink Floyd. I, yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. It's music mumbles after all. Number two. Number two. The mysterious origins of Peanut Duck. <laughs> I like that. I like that. There's a song called Peanut Duck that no one knows where it came from. During the peak of Northern Soul, it was common practice to groove to a tune shrouded in mystery, intentionally mislabeled by DJs who sought to keep these musical gems to themselves. Then, in the 1980s, one such enigmatic track captured the atten the attention of many: Peanut Duck. Peanut Duck. Allegedly attributed to a woman named... Quack, quack. All right, hold on. I want to tell you my duck name. Uh, my okay. duck joke first. All right. So why did the duck go to prison? For smoking quack. For selling quack. Oh. Oh, that dude. I, I'm, I made that joke. I'm very proud. And I just wait for a day when someone tells me that joke and I could be like an 80-year-old man be like, you know, son, I made up that joke. And they're just going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, crazy old man made up the... Chicken cross the road and get to the other side. Yeah, we believe you. Good job. And I could be like, <laughs> but it's true. Single tear rolls down my cheek. That's quacktastic. Peanut duck. Allegedly attributed to a woman named Marsha G. The identity of G herself remains an elusive and uncertain figure with no verifiable records of her recording this or any other song. As a result, the origins of Peanut Duck have remained a compelling enigma for years. 
The song opens with it opening with G claiming there is a brand new dance that's sweeping the nation. The peanut duck is the new sensation. From there, the lyrics go a bit misconstrued, but an intriguing level of passion keeps inviting you in. However, despite many attempts to unveil its true origin, the mystery remains unsolved. Who the hell made peanut duck? Where did it come from? And why do I care? I don't know either. Mm, music mumbles. Music mumbles. <laughs> Motherfuckers. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got, you know what? I have no real comment beyond the fact that that seems like a fun thing, right? Like back in the day, they're like, we're just going to mislabel this track. So when we play it, no one knows the name. It's, it's like, like a- that bar that doesn't have a name, right? It's like early Rick rolling, like in a way, like where they're just like, no, like, like you think you're going to play this? Nope. It's duck. It's peanut <laughs> duck. To be fair, the the song actually does like say peanut duck in the song. It, it, on this article, they uh, you could actually listen to the peanut duck song. Wonderful. I will have to jam that. Later. We will. We will jam to peanut duck. God damn right. We will All jam right. to peanut duck. That <laughs> mysterious track. That's crazy sound of peanut duck. Where the hell did it come from? What the fuck? Well done. Yeah, I thought well so. Done. All right. All right. Next With segment. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that guy? Remember that gal? Well, now they're dead. All right, guys. Strap in. We got a lot. Maggie Smith dies at 89. Chris Christofferson dies at 88. Gavin Creel dies at 48. John Ashton dies at 76. Whew. It's a big week for celebrity deaths. So, Maggie Smith is a two-time Oscar-winning actor, best known for playing Professor Mc... Oh, my. Oh my Professor God. McGonagall. Thank you, McGonagall, in the Harry Potter film franchise. She also played the tart-tongued Dowager Countess on Downtown Abbey. She died Friday. Her publicist and children have confirmed. She was 89. And uh, so personally, I mean, I only know her because I didn't watch Downtown Abbey. And I know she did a bunch of older uh, roles. She's been acting for a long time. And I might notice her, of you know, when I rewatch some of those films. But what I know her from is Professor McGonagall. You know, the, the one teacher you liked in the Harry Potter movies. Wasn't she also? She turned into a cat. I know that. She was Wendy in Hook. She was Wendy in Hook. That's how I know her. Ah, oh, okay. You know what, Ryan? You win the film award today. Thank as you. As far as this episode is concerned, I, I, I tip my hat to you, sir. Yeah, old Wendy. Yeah, yeah. She, yeah, she. Yeah, played. Wendy, darling. Yeah, 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 dude. Like, that's how I know her, and that's where I remember seeing her in Harry Potter. I'm like, oh, it's from from Hook. Well, Maggie Smith, you will be missed, and uh, apparently for me and Ryan, mostly in genre films. Yeah, for sure. So moving on to uh, Chris Christofferson, who attained success as both a groundbreaking country music singer, songwriter, and a Hollywood film and movie star. He died Saturday in his home in Maui, Hawaii. I mean, that's a yeah, night- yeah. Way to live that that was your home. 88 years old. That's a good place to go. Uh, no cause of death was given, but he was described as passing away peacefully while surrounded by family. He was 88. To younger audiences, he was best known as playing the mentor to Wesley Snipes' vampire Hunter Blade. Nice. Whistler. I I know exactly who he is. Yes. Uh, Additionally, he starred in the third generation of A Star is Born. Yeah, so uh, two things. One, Whistler. That was the character in Blade. Killer, killer job in that. And yeah, that is actually 100% what I know him from. But uh, I know him from other shit, too. You probably do. I don't. Can you think of any of those other things? Not off the tip of my tongue, no. Well, then moving right along, that he is, um, so A Star is Born is a film. I know Barbara Streisand, I believe, was in one of them. I think maybe even the one he did. Well, he played the main character, the Bradley Cooper character in the new one. And it was, uh, it's been remade three times, so there's four versions of it. And uh, this guy did the third one, Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga is the fourth version. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I can't. Th- I know I've seen him though. He's got such a recognizable face. But he was the gruff old guy who helped Blade on his vampire hunt. Exactly. Yeah. I yeah. don't know any of his country music. I assume. It, I mean, because I don't listen to country music. But even if it was 
uh, genre of music I do listen to. I don't know a lot about music. So you haven't heard of him either, really, though, have you? No. As I've, far as mu- music is concerned. I haven't followed his music. No, I'm actually pulling up his... Uh... I'm pulling up his thing right now, and yeah, I mean, he's he's best known for his music. That's what comes up first. So, so I, there are the listeners of this podcast being like, "How do you not know Stan Lee made comic books? Oh, you mean that old guy with the Marvel movies? That's right. us. That's us right now, right? Oh, that's right. I remember him in Payback. He was totally in Payback. I remember him in that. So he was in uh, he was in uh, the Planet of the Apes in 2001. Oh, he was. Yeah, dude, uh, the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes. Yep, yep. I liked that movie. Now, granted, it it uh, wasn't the that, best, but yeah. I really liked it. Other than that, it's like all westerns. So he's a western guy. That makes sense because he's a country music star. Yep. So that makes so yeah. But no, I knew I knew him in something else. Pay. I remember him in Payback. Well, Chris Christopherson, I tip my hat to you, sir. And eighty eighty eight is nothing to shrug your shoulders to. You know, well done. No, uh, but unfortunately, this one was a little younger here. Uh, Gavin Creel, one of Broadway's most popular and acclaimed leading men, died in Manhattan today just two months after being diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of sarcoma. He was 48. Creel made his Broadway debut in 2002 in a lead role of Thoroughly Modern Millie, earning a Tony Award nomination. He had major roles in Hello, Dolly, Waitress, Into the Woods, and more. So, yeah, uh, Ryan and I actually met in between fifth and sixth grade at acting class. And uh, it was it was just kind of like a fun improv class. But then they alternate between that and then doing like an right. actual theatrical show. Yeah, the first half was, yeah, improv practice. And then, yeah, the second half was, yeah, we did a full production, like full. So I, I know you did Hello, Dolly. Um, no, I never did Hello, Dolly. You never did Hello, uh, No, a uh, friend of ours uh, that we met in acting class as well, his name is Mike Renda, we, we, he did Hello, Dolly. Yeah, he was a big one in there. Yeah, he liked doing that one. We I did think Grease, I, I did Peter Pan. Yeah, we uh, we didn't do Into the Woods either. I would have loved to do Into the Woods, I do, though. yeah. I, I want to say that. I mean, as far as uh, stage plays are concerned, I mean, I always liked that. It's like they blended all the musicals, excuse me, all the musicals, all the fairy tales into like kind of one narrative. And it was kind of like an adult driven fairy tale. And I really appreciated into the woods. I even liked that Disney version that came out with, uh, yeah. Anna Kendrick and it was Chris funny. Pine and agony. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, no, that I, I thought it was funny. Like, no, I love that. There are giants in the sky. I don't know why that made me laugh my ass off. I just like the, the time. little red riding hood was a little thief she just was like stealing everything out of that uh that bakery and emily blunt was just like it's fine i want a kid and she's a kid let her rob us blind who cares <laughs> who cares if we die and starve because it's the middle ages and no one's gonna cut us some slack and we'll just be crutched dead crutched anyways <laughs> so um so anyways rest this, in peace gavin, gavin creel. creel yeah only 48 but uh that's a shame sarcoma and to die so young from i don't disease. know what that is but, well, i we'd have to look it up but i'm just saying dude two months can you imagine finding out something was wrong with you and then like going downhill so quick that two months later you pass on that is insane. That is shell shock for anyone who knows you any loved ones you have obviously you yourself you know, you know it's bad when John Cena walks in. Oh, God. You're like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> this is my wish. I'm going to die. Oh, no. John Cena. Like, John Cena is basically he, the Grim Reaper now. The Make-A-Wish <laughs> Foundation. Can you imagine, though? He's, like, he really he's, is. John Cena's like, dude, it's okay. I'm for the guy next to you. Like, I'm sorry. So He's awesome. He's awesome. He's the man for all that he does. But I can't help but make a morbid realization that John Cena's basically become the Grim Reaper. He's visiting yeah, he's, everybody right before they die. Yeah, you like, see you see John Cena, you know you don't got many, many moons you, left. That you're going down your last road. Oh, oh. <laughs> so moving along. Does he have like a catchphrase? Because you know it's like, uh, do you, you can't smell? see me. You can't see me. Well, you can and then you die. Well, that's his thing. You can't. So he just shows up and goes, you can't. and then you die. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> And I think it was like never give up. That's his other thing. That's why every. That's why he's like a big, or whatever. Never give up. All right, we got more dead people. Unfortunately, we got more dead people. Not just John Cena. Who isn't dead? Who isn't dead? 
He's, I mean, I, God, I hope not. I mean, it's not like I'm in touch with him. He is the undead. That would have He's, been very sudden if that just happened. You heard it here on Earthling Entertainment. John Cena is Grim Reaper incarnate. By the way, though, uh, John Cena did this film with Aquafina, and it's like a Amazon original, or that was just released on Amazon. I'm not sure, but it's called Jackpot, and uh, you could win a big, large money in the lottery, but everyone who, like, you have 24 hours where everyone around you can kill you and claim your lottery money. Oh, shit. So Aquafina's on the run from, like, the entire city of Los Angeles being protected by John Cena, and it is a fantastically funny film. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Now, back to sad. Here's a yeah, dead let's, let's go back to dead people. Right. Um, So John Ashton, the actor known for his role as John Taggart in the Beverly Hills Cop film series, has died. He was 76. He starred as cop John Taggart, opposed it to Eddie Murphy in the Beverly Hills Cop franchise, beginning with the original 1984 action comedy. He returned for the sequel, Beverly, Beverly, Hot, bleh, Beverly Hills Cop 2, and reprised the role again in this year's Netflix follow-up, Beverly Hills Cop Axel F. Ashton passed away peacefully on September 26th in Colorado. Colorado. Yeah, so, uh, you know, he hasn't done an amazingly, like, huge list of movies in his career, but the Beverly Hills Cop films were always like... They're iconic. Yeah, and the first two were really good, and everyone says the third one isn't as good. And this fourth one having such a good reception, it's nice, because they did bring him back, and uh, you know, I I really thought they would change the name. The entire time in production, I kept thinking, they're gotta change the name to Beverly Hills Cop 4, because like, Beverly Hills Cop Axel F, like, I don't know, at and they, I guess they did change it a little bit because it's Axel Foley when I, because I got to work on this film. Um, I did I, very little work on this film, but I was there. He's for, in the credits, guys. That, fair enough. I was uh, <laughs> in Detroit. We did the scene in the opening scene where there was the uh, the snowplow that's kind of like running through, and there's the ATVs and the old big crash and stuff. The stuff takes place in Detroit. Well, I was here at the time, obviously, so I got to work a week of uh, that show, and that was a lot of fun. Dude, yeah, that's awesome. So that's I was, was rooting say. for the film. I wanted it to come out. But uh, we actually, didn't we have, uh, we got a breaking news, actually, on a recent death as well. That's right. Unfortunately, it just happened while we're recording, believe it or not, that uh, the, uh, I shouldn't say actor, the gentleman, Frank Fritz, who did the American Pickers show. So The he was shorter one, guy. Yeah, who was the, one of the original guys, because... I believe in season 15, Frank unfortunately left the show due to uh, back surgery, and uh, he had a stroke after that, and he was just unable to continue the show after that. So the Fred Wolf, I believe his name, and his brother and everybody took over, but Frank Fritz was one of the original guys. He and was, he was like He a was good... a guy who looked like Mario. He was short, yeah, he was a Italian. Guy, yeah. And he really brought... A, he was a yin to that tall dude's yang. Like, they really... It was. I remember enjoying. He was a lovable teddy show. bear guy. I remember enjoying watching that show. Well, he could be spunky too. I remember there were times he'd be spicy. Yeah, but yeah like yeah. yeah. It, I remember really enjoying that show. Like, uh, even though like it always seemed at the time, I'm like these guys don't make as much money as the other shows because it's like, oh man, I'm gonna flip this for a good fifty bucks, and then you got like Pawn Stars where they're like, I bought it for two thousand, I'm gonna sell it for fifty million. <laughs> like you, know, like you know, like. <laughs> Well, you know, as long as its sales are consistent. I will say that uh, Frank Fritz, I heard uh, it's very, if you want to look up to it, uh, that he had, unfortunately, a little bit of substance problems with alcohol, which may have led to the stroke that kind of did this downward spiral. But he was on TV, the heart of the show. He was the, the lovable character. And I will, I will miss seeing him on the show like I have the past few years. I kept hoping... He would come back for at least a cameo, but unfortunately, he is not. And uh, so Frank Fritz, the co co host of American Pickers, has died at age fifty eight. He, you know, they taught very me a young. Fifty eight yeah. is very young. Yeah, you know, and they taught me a lot about old Americana, you know, items and stuff like that. That was a big thing. You know, like the old oil stuff, like the old Coca Cola. Yeah. You know, thing. Like this, like, you run into outdoor gas pumps. They're the ones yeah. who taught me what the word patina meant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, they taught me a lot. Like, yeah, like, don't mess with anything. When you have something that's old, don't F with it. 
You know what I mean? Like, cause you're, you're, you're going to mess that people want it. What you mean is like, uh, yeah, don't, don't paint it. it don't yeah. try to fix it. Yeah. Well, wait, that yeah. was the message of the show. I don't know yeah. how true that is. At least in their circles though, it seemed to be very true. So Frank Fritz, you will be missed. Rest in peace, dude. Looking through Jesus's scrummage upstairs now, just like, hmm, what we got here? Hmm. <laughs> it's like, I found the Holy Grail. I, uh, you know, I couldn't get pretty... it though. I would only pay fifty dollars. I, was I gonna, wasn't gonna. Get it. I was gonna say it's in pretty rough shape. You know, we're looking at it here, and uh, you know, it's got a little chip here. You know, that's gonna affect its value. I mean, and it is over two thousand years old. And I, I gotta mean, make a buck. I, I gotta, gotta make a buck. You know, <laughs> meet me in the middle. <laughs> we grew up on those kind of shows. Honestly, that shit was fun. Even though, even if half of it was planted. <laughs> I don't think it was planted. It, I think if it was planted, there'd be like a uh, like an issue number one of Superman in every fucking episode. And sometimes yeah. they were just like, "Here's an oil can." Like, so what I don't a nice oil can. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Let's jump into uh, Earthlink Entertainment headlines. A RoboCop series is in development at Prime Video. James Wan to produce. This comes to us from Nerdist.com. <laughs> a year or so back, it was reported that Prime Video was developing a se- several series based on MGM properties. Now, via Variety, we know at least one of those will be based on the classic sci-fi film RoboCop. Peter Ako, if I, I hope I'm saying that right, Peter Ako is developing a RoboCop TV series along with James Wan under his Atomic Monster banner. The official synopsis for the upcoming RoboCop show is the following. A giant tech conglomerate collaborates with the local police department to introduce a technologically advanced enforcer to c- combat rising crime. A police officer who's part man Part machine. That part man. Part machine. I gotta be honest, I hit the wrong button. But <laughs> that pretty part, part, man. part man. Part machine. There, that, that, you know, in context, if I had done that properly, I, I feel like that would have killed. That pretty much sounds <laughs> like the premise to Paul Verhoeven's. Verhoeven's, yeah, he's the guy who did the first one. He also did the, uh, the Starship Troopers in 1997. So he's all about like the satire of just like, you know, the over the top, like military, like showing you how ridiculous it is through satire. Like he's the South Park of, of movies. And that film, uh, was back in 1987 was, uh, the original Robocop. A large part of what made the original work so well was that it was satire of consumerist American culture. That is something other sequels and TV series have forgotten to lean to. We'll see if the Prime Video iteration can finally recapture what made the original RoboCop so great. I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah, I use that reference all the time. Yeah, dude. Like, there were so many. And it's right. Like, it's like. And then, yeah, like like with uh, how he did in Starship Troopers, would you like to know more? Would you like to know more? Yeah, well, I really do like RoboCop. There was the uh, the original three films, which uh, were RoboCop 1 and 2, both starring Peter Weller. And then they uh, they replaced Peter Weller in the third one. And that was, uh, and it was PG-13, so they really kind of went in a weird direction there. There was also a bunch of other RoboCop movies. Now, I don't know if these were made for TV movies or if they were like episodes of a RoboCop TV show that were put together into movies, but there was like three or four of like Neo Detroit, like RoboCops came out in the 90s and I, I've like RoboCop Lockdown and RoboCop Meltdown and they, they all came out like the same year or two. So that was weird. The RoboCop video game just came out. There was uh, that remake in 2014, which Gary Ullman was in, I believe. I no, no, I don't know. I don't know if Gary Ullman was. I take that back. But Michael Keaton was definitely in it, and that remake was bad. Oh, yeah. I I've only seen the original RoboCop one, two, and three. Fair enough. That's Did the you... only ones I've ever seen. I just I was a big fan of RoboCop and I really liked the whole eighties idea of like let's take this rated R movie that is not for children at all and market it to children. Buy all your Robocop action figures and collectibles. Here's your Nintendo game. 
RoboCop. There's a guy melting and screaming for his mother as his eyes, do, like, implode. RoboCop. For your kids, kind of. Dead or alive, your money's coming with me. Exactly. <laughs> <sighs> well, you know what? Sometimes money isn't enough to, like, to get the job done, believe it or not. Kind of like in this next story. Headline number two. Tekken boss, Katsuhiro Harada, actually tried to get Colonel Sanders as a guest character, but KFC turned him down. What? This comes to us from MyGN.com. Tekken development chief Katsuhiro Harada revealed he tried and failed to have Colonel Sanders added to the fighting game as a guest character. A long time ago, I wanted to have Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken fight, Harada told the gamer. So I asked to use Colonel Sanders and go to the head office in Japan. Unfortunately, Harada's pitch was turned down with a bad look. Since then, Colonel Sanders actually did appear in the video game, I Love You, Colonel Sanders, a finger-licking good dating simulator, a dating sim commissioned by KFC, and released because that for, makes sense. for free on stream on September 24th, excuse 2019. Me, excuse me, hold on. It was released on Steam. Yes. Yes. Yeah, on Steam on September 24th, 2019, as a bizarre promo for the fast food chain. Still, Tekken 8 fans do have the game's third DLC character, Hey, I, oh my gosh. Heiachi <laughs> Mishima to look forward to. And one, the once dead fighting veterans joins the roster as part of the upcoming free story expansion for Tekken 8 titled Unforgotten Echoes. Ooh. So, all you Tekken fans, if you were hoping for Colonel Sanders, just wait. Here's other people. <laughs> well, and, and I do think that that's cool, right? I feel like they're all fighting for that because I remember, you know, like, because, like, Mortal Kombat, that's a big thing. Like, you've got uh, Highlander from The Boys is in the new one. Highlander? You mean yeah. Homelander? Homelander, sorry. Okay, because Highlander, sorry, sorry. to be clear. <laughs> that was two different things. Sorry, yeah, my bad. Homelander so. was in the new Mortal Kombat uh, as well as someone else. I know Robocop's been on it. I know they, well, they even had, had Freddy, Ram they, they had, had Jason. Rambo. Dude, even, uh, so there was this um, Justice League was, uh, I don't know. It was like Justice League Goes Bad. I forget what it's I, called. I, but yeah. the Ninja Turtles were in that one. So they they always, every fighting game gets these characters. Whoa. It's weird that Colonel Sanders wouldn't do it. Like, were they afraid it would be bad for the brand? Like, who the hell cares? They're just holding out for I a mean, bigger one. I like, mean, it's Tekken. Well, they did a dating simulator. So they're like, listen, Colonel Sanders. That was Sa Sims. Well, I'm just saying, Colonel Sanders, he can fight, but, you know, he... he he can't fight. He can't do that. But he, you could try to fuck him. Well, that that <laughs> makes that makes sense in The Sims. Uh, no, it's not The Sims. Wasn't it? I no. That's what it said. No, read it. I'm going to. It's a dating simulator. A dating. Oh, a dating sim. sim. My bad. I saw Sim and it, so, and it so, threw me off. No, hold on though. Think about that though. They're like, you can't be a fighter. You, you know, Colonel Sanders can't kick gas, but you could want to have sex with him. I mean, to be fair, <laughs> those herbs and spices, bro. Seven herbs and spices. All, all seven, dude. All of them. My favorite was Futurama. There was a movie they did, which uh, was called Bender's Big Score. And he was like, hey, I even found Colonel's secret rec recipe. And he pulls out a piece of paper and it just said, Chick uh, chicken, grease, salt. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret recipe. Uh, I want to try the, what were they called when they found like all like the living creatures that were like the children of the Percy Poplars. Poplars. That's yes. what I want. Poplars. They were like, uh, so they made it as like a fast food version of popcorn chicken, but they were called Poplars and they were actually the young of the Omicrons from Omicron Percy I ate. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. And then, and then Zoidberg pulls up. I don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, speaking All right. Uh, speaking of some good tasty things, Ooh. what about a franchise? Do you prefer regular, or which would be the Jurassic Park films, or do you like the new recipe, which would be the Jurassic World films? Uh, well, it looks like they're keeping the Jurassic World title in the next installment, which I think is a interesting mistake. choice. Yeah. And, well, they, they had a trilogy, and then they had another trilogy. This should be like Jurassic One. Originally, when they it came out that they were going to do another Jurassic story it was uh it was they said it was gonna be called jurassic city 
And considering the film description of the new Jurassic Park no longer fits like we're hanging out in a city, maybe that's why they changed their name because the new one is Jurassic Park Rebirth. But anyways, here is headline number three. Scarlett Johansson's Jurassic World Rebirth just got a huge update. This comes to us from Collider.com. Filming on Jurassic World Rebirth has officially wrapped, as confirmed by producer Frank Marshall. Filming began back in June in Thailand and wrapped after 106 days of shooting. That's, on, that's a really long shoot. On September 27th in the United Kingdom which definitely suggests we'll be getting another globe-trotting Jurassic adventure. The plot centers on a daring mission led by covert operations expert Zora Bennett, played by Scarlett Johansson, to secure genetic material from the world's three most massive dinosaurs. Johansson is joined by a cast that is the very definition of stacked, including Jonathan Bailey as paleontologist Dr. Henry Loomis, and Mahershala Mahershala Ali. His name is Mahershala Ali. Mahershala Ali. He is an Oscar winner. We have to pronounce his name correctly. Thank you very much. As team leader Duncan Kincaid, Rupert Friend, Manuel Garcia Rolfo, and Luna Blaze also star in the epic adventure directed by Gareth Edwards. Gareth Edwards, who directed Rogue One. Ooh. And Godzilla, 2014. Fuck yeah. Known for his visually stunning work on Rogue One, uh, Star Wars Story, and last year's The Creator. The film's screenplay is penned by David Kep, the original Jurassic Park screenwriter. We've talked about him here on the podcast before. Which... Yeah, and you get the original writer of the franchise. You have to hope that, that that's going to boost the, 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 the sequel, you know? Oh, of course. Which really does add to the feel of getting the band back together and coming full circle. The story takes a turn for the dramatic when Zora's team runs into a shipwrecked family stranded on a mysterious island with a secret hidden deep within. As they attempt to navigate their uncompromising surroundings, they uncover shocking truths that have been hidden from the world for decades, setting the stage for a thrill ride for the ages, and it will have dinosaurs too, obviously. I like Jurassic Park. I want more Jurassic Park. I even watched that Netflix series, Jurassic Park, like Camp Cretaceous. And then they had a sequel series that's out now where it's like Jurassic Park, uh, I don't know, Chaos Theory, I think. And uh, I, you know what my favorite is? There's this game called Jurassic Park Evolution, and it is straight up like SimCity. I'm making a little park. I get to breed my dinosaurs. I get to make the pen and have little, like, uh, it's, it's running a zoo. It's one of those simulators. So I've just always been a huge fan of Jurassic Park. I, I mean, dinosaurs eating people, even though the more time that passes, we find out that dinosaurs don't look as quite, the way we thought they would i did appreciate how in the film franchise they addressed that by being like uh yeah that's because we put frog dna in them yes that's why they don't look exactly like dinosaurs don't worry about it remember who you are that is a t-rex up in the clouds looking down at a chicken Hawk? <laughs> <laughs> So, well, how do you, uh, no, how do you feel about uh, the new Dress Park? Or Dress Park in general? Or really, this one with Scarlett Johansson? Come on. I love Scarlett. She's going to kill it. Uh, I hope they did a great job. I thought it was an interesting choice to go Jurassic World because I thought that was done. Yeah, well, it just feels like you should have changed it. Now, I, I agree that Jurassic City kind of feels like a step back from Jurassic World. So maybe could have literally what... just called it the Jurassic or something uh, like that. Like, I don't know. They, uh, there was other options is all I'm saying. A Jurassic story. <laughs> uh, not so much. Like into the, like, 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 what? I don't know. I'm terrible with my period, so I don't know what is the next one after Jurassic. Tri- so like, it's it, Triassic. Into yeah, the Triassic. Triassic. Maybe Triassic, like Triassic. into the Triassic. Like maybe move yeah. it on. Ooh. You know? Yeah. Call it into the Triassic period. The huh? end, the end of, the end of Jurassic. Like call yeah. it, like literally, or call it like, like, like the death of Jurassic Park, the end of Jurassic, like something. You could literally call it anything. I, I don't know. But they went with Jurassic World Rebirth. And, you know, uh, 
Dinosaurs are extinct. I thought that franchise was extinct. Speaking of being extinct, apparently Chucky is now extinct. Chucky canceled by Sci-Fi and USA after three seasons. Headline number three. Chucky. Number Daddy four. Daddy. Oh, it's number four? Number four. Chucky dead. That's the important takeaway here. Not me being able to count or not. This comes to <laughs> us from Deadline.com. <laughs> Chucky's murderous days are over, at least for now. The series, based on the classic horror movie franchise, will not return for a fourth season on Sci-Fi and USA Network. The news comes four months after part two of Chucky's third season aired its finale on both NBC Universal Cable Networks. Series creator, executive producer, Don Mancini, or Mancini, I think it's Mancini. Yeah, Mancini have had been looking to carry on. He revealed in April that he had pitched a fourth season, saying at the time that it's something I really like to do. His enthusiasm helped bring the hashtag Renew Chucky fan campaign, which... I don't know. Have fan campaigns ever actually worked? It, it did with Honestly. Sonic. Well, it did with Sonic to, like, change CGI, not to bring to make, like, a sequel after a movie flopped. I don't know. Maybe they're listening more to the masses. It's a different time. I don't know. But uh, so we, they have been rallying support, obviously, for a season four. Uh, needless to say, today's outcome is not what he had hoped for. But Mancini, who also created and wrote movie franchise, uh, remained graceful in his reaction, vowing that this is not Chucky's last sp uh, spree. He says here, I'm heartbroken over the news that Chucky won't be coming back for a fourth season, but I'm so grateful for the killer. Three years we did have. He said, I'd like to thank UCP, Sci-Fi, Peacock, Eat the Cat, our awesome cast and Toronto-based crew, the best in the business. And finally, to our amazing fans, a big bloody hug. Your incredible hashtag renewed Chucky campaign really warm Chucky's cold heart. Chucky will return. He always comes back. <laughs> yeah. That was my best Chucky laugh. So my thoughts on Chucky, if, if, if I may. You may. Child's Play 1, 2, and 3 are definitely the classic, right? And then when the fourth one came out, which was called Bride of Chucky, I believe it was 1998, and I believe uh, the same director of Freddy vs. Jason ended up directing Bride of Chucky, but he took a more comedic stance. One of the best soundtracks in movie history, like for real. Really? Oh, I I, I love the Bride of Chucky soundtrack. It's amazing. Give me some examples. Why? What's on there? Oh, I can't even. Don't put me on the spot like that. I just remember it's awesome. Yeah, then don't bring it up, Ryan. Fine. Anyways, <laughs> don't worry. I don't remember that director's name who I'm currently talking about. Anyways, uh, he brought a more comedic aspect to Bride of Chucky, and it, it kind of rejuvenated the series a bit. But then in 2004, they did a direct sequel to Bride of Chucky, which was Seed of Chucky, which once again kind of tried to keep it a little bit comedic. Unfortunately, that one did not do as well, and it was a long time before we got more sequels. However, we did get two more sequels. The next one came out, and it was called uh, Curse of Chucky. That's yeah. right. And it brought in Fiona Dwarf, the daughter of the actor who plays Chucky, Fred Dwarf, I believe. I believe. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. His, well, anyways... Uh, the daughter, Fiona Dwarf, played a, a great character who uh, basically Charles Lee Ray was <laughs> stabbed her mother <coughs> while she was pregnant with this character and severed the spine of the baby in utero, which is why this woman is in a wheelchair. So in Curse of Chucky, the protagonist is in a wheelchair and uh, it, it, was, and it was crazy. Then but, there was another one. Hold and, on. And it introduced splitting of the soul. Like Chucky no, could No, they like, did not. Oh, that was not that no, one? No, that was not that one. Then they had Cult of Chucky. That was it. That and was it. that was the one where they did the splitting of the soul. Right. But since you asked for it, this is the Bride of Chucky soundtrack. Just real quick. Call Me by Blondie. Living Dead Girl. Rob Zombie. Boogie King by the Screaming Cheetah Wheelies. Thunder Kiss 65. White Zombie. Blisters. Coal Chamber. See You in Hell. Monster Magnet. Love You to Death. Typo Negative. Human Disease, Slayer. Like, dude, right? Bled for Days, Static X. Uh, the Son of X-51, Power Man 5000. Love for Sale, Motorhead. Fucking Lemmy is God. So God is literally on the soundtrack. <laughs> 
All right, you know what? I will say that does sound like a really good soundtrack. Definitely of the time. I love it. That's what I'm. It was. I might great. download the Bride of Chucky soundtrack. It's so good. It's so good. That one and uh, uh, Freddy vs. Jason, another great soundtrack. It's same director. Maybe yep, he, there you maybe go. he has good taste in music. It's if he had, if he had a taste. say in any of that, but. Yep. Uh, so what I was going to get at is with all those sequels and all that lore that they added. By the way, I wanted to say the uh, after Seed of Chucky, those following two sequels went back to horror and weren't as much comedy. But uh, then the TV show comes about. And we I watched it. We we earlier in the podcast, yeah, we, we were, were going to review it and stuff. We did a couple. But the, the reason why I bring that up is because the um, the show kept all the continuity from the movies. They kept... Andy Barkley, the original protagonist of the original ones from the 80s. Yep. Uh, they kept they brought back characters from the second film, all the sequels, and every weird thing that happened, even like him having a girlfriend named Tiffany who possessed <laughs> uh, Jennifer Tilly eventually. Even that was brought in. Fiona Dwarf, all of that was in the series. So it was a really good series if you and liked it. If you liked Chucky, because you had the first seven movies and it connected to three seasons and it was all, all one story. And Devin Sawa was like a leading character in like every, right? He was always a different character. And he as killed... far as the show is concerned. Yeah. He yeah. Kept and he coming killed back. it. Yeah. He, he... Devin Sawa was a great actor. Dude, in that he film. did so good. You know what? Devin Sawa, I forget how long he's been acting sometimes. And then I rewatch Casper of Christina Ricci. Yep. And it's like, that kid was Casper. Yeah, he was totally fucking Casper. He was even in Little Giants with Icebox. You remember that football movie with Rick Moramis? Wasn't he in Wild America with JTT? Wild America. And I think I think the <laughs> other Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Jonathan Taylor Thomas. The hot throb of the nineties. I kinda think the other kid was Shane West, like from a walk to remember too. Yep. Yep. Nailed it. And then Idle Hands, of course. Idle Hands is just simply a, a horror classic. Yeah. Uh, that was early 2000s. Seth Green, really, really good. Evan, Devin Zawa. Uh, Jessica Alba in one of her earlier roles. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great one. That uh, was a great one. That one deserved an Oscar. That was award-winning film, that Idle Hand. And you know what? Disney thinks that Deadpool and Wolverine is also Oscar worthy. Can you believe it? I mean, a superhero movie being like put up for those kind of awards. Well, that brings us to headline number five. Marvel Studios vying for award season attention for Deadpool and Wolverine. This comes to us from Nerdist.com. Deadpool and Wolverine already dominated the box office this summer. Now it's looking to gain some wins in the awards circuit. Marvel Studios is gutsy with their award campaign for the film, submitting it to multiple major award shows in many categories, according to Variety. Among the award shows Marvel Studios is submitting to is the Golden Globes comedy category. That makes sense. The third installment in the franchise will attempt to snag nominations for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor. Ryan Reynolds will be positioned as the lead actor for this role as one of the titular characters, Deadpool, who is also known as Wade Wilson. In a surprising turn, Hugh Jackman will now be optioned as the supporting actor at all major award shows. We're talking Golden Globes, Screen Actors Guild Awards, Critics Choice and Oscars. I don't know if uh, the best supporting actor of the whole year is going to go to Hugh Jackman. I uh, would do it. I'd vote. But here's the thing. I don't think he has to even win. If he's even nominated, if he's even just one of the nominees, then you get to say, you know, Oscar nominated actor Hugh Jackman starring. In, you know what I'm saying? In my opinion. I mean, he's already in. You know what I mean, though, For as far as marketing for that particular film. My opinion's a little biased. I'm a huge fan of his. But I have to say, you know my opinion on his role as Wolverine in this movie. He's always been great as Wolverine, but in this movie, he was Wolverine. Like, he was really fucking Wolverine. And and you could feel his pain. Like, he would act... Like, this wasn't just a, oh, I'm, okay, I guess I'm Wolverine again. I'll put on the suit. No. He fucking, like... I, I He teared me up in a few of his emotional scenes talking about, you know, his where he fucked up. You know, well, you know, clearly you're not alone because that's, you know, that's why they're like, I think he could win. Like some enough people, they were like, he can win an Oscar that they would put him up for. It, it was moving. I really was. I do agree. 
So historically, superhero films do not usually get major award show recognition or Star Wars, for that matter, <laughs> other than visual effects categories or obviously John Williams always wins. Sometimes they get costume. They get co- Yeah, they get costume and they get music. Multiple guilds, especially the Producers Guild of America, will likely recognize the film as they often award films with box office success. Not all, eh. not all the time. Well, it is the highest grossing R-rated movie ever. So, I mean, that is a big deal. I don't beating itself. It was at like 1.3 billion last time I checked. And, and literally, the one that it knocked off of the number one rated R was Deadpool one. No, it wasn't. It was Joker. Oh, my bad. I, I, I must have gotten a bad source. Uh, so Deadpool and Wolverine releases on digital platforms on October 1st. Yeah! That's today. That's today. Oh, my God. I'm watching it later. And 4K Blu-ray and DVD on, for Joe, October 22nd. Well, I mean, I get digital, too. I like buying things more than once because wasting money seems like a good way to live my life. Yeah. <laughs> I buy helmets, Joe. Yeah, fair I enough. have so many Star Wars helmets in my apartment. It's getting cluttered. Well, you know what's funny? Uh, that is good, though. Uh, what movie I did buy today, it came out October 1st, and I didn't get Deadpool and Wolverine. I bought Kevin Smith's 430 movie. Woohoo! Now, the 430 movie is a kind of biographical movie about Kevin Smith's kind of alter ego when he was a child who dates this uh, woman in a first date at a movie, and it is an 80s homage to John Hughes, and I kind of fucked up his version of that description. But the point is, it looks really good, and I'm really happy. And that's it's not an article. I'm not talking about it, like, officially. I just, I like Kevin Smith, and I, I like it when he tries new things. He tried to do a horror movie with Tusk, and he succeeded, as far as I'm concerned. That was scary as shit. We almost lost the man. Like, we wouldn't have had this. Like, it's, you know what I mean? He had a major heart attack. Yeah, he definitely did. So and it, it means a lot to me to, yeah. That he's still doing stuff, for sure. Yeah, well, you know what? To continue, though, he also did a uh, a suspense film when he did uh, Red State. Yes, of course. Yeah, with uh, John Goodman. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a a different kind of movie. If you want to see a movie that you're like, you would never know Kevin Smith directed that film. And Tusk, of course, we have to say it. Well, that's what I just said. Yeah. Oh, you did. Yeah, yeah. Tusk yeah. was a horror film. Yes, of course. Uh, but no, I'm sorry. I mentioned my helmets. Let me say one thing, just because I don't know. If <laughs> that's why you did it. though I brought up Tusk. You've been thinking about your helmets this whole time, I'm waiting, a, waiting Joe, for me to finish. Joe, I'm always just so you can get back to the Star Wars. Dude, helmets. that's like a story of my life. Always <laughs> thinking about my helmet. You know what I'm saying? Like, all right, all right. Back to st- <laughs> we'll give Ryan this. Ryan, tell us about your Star Wars helmet. So, I. Uh, I just bought a new one, and it usually I buy from Hasbro Pulse. This one came from, straight from Disney Store. It's made by a different company. I forget. But it was what I talk about all the time on this podcast, Darth Revan. It's Darth Revan's helmet from the Knights of the Old Republic video game. He's been in a couple novels. He's been in a lot of comic books. So here's me saying that this might be a hinting at a special report, that the fact that this is a helmet, and many times Joe told me earlier, Sometimes toys kind of do hint what's coming. Maybe we will see a Revan movie or a Revan series. Rumor always had it that it was going to be Keanu Reeves taking the role. Who knows? But uh, this Ryan, is just Ryan a rumor. Ryan is rumors. holding out for a, a, a Old Republic film movie yeah. series. And uh, you are right. Like Toys do sometimes leak major spoilers. If nothing else, this means they're trying to gauge interest. At the very least, if these sell well, they might be like, oh, well, if Revan is such a character that's marketable, maybe we should do this High Republic. That's uh, why I sorry. bought one as soon as I saw it. <laughs> Bless you. <sighs> no worries. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So we'll see how that goes. But you bought it, right? You're happy. You're getting. You're getting when do you get it? Is it like uh, one of those ones you got to wait two years I, for? No, no. Disney Store it doesn't do what Hasbro does, where they're like, pre-order this now and you'll get it next year. Uh, no, uh, D- Disney, when they have it, they have it. And like I said, this was done by a different toy company. I forget what it's called. I'm going to mention it on the next podcast just because I want to bring it up because... Yeah, yeah, do, do you, honestly, if you want to do, do a little review... You can do a whole segment on this if you want, but you got to do your research. I'll bring it with me. Uh, I'll bring it with me and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do a little research on it because uh, this is now a third company that is making these kind of Star Wars helmets, which I'm obsessed with. So if you're into collecting shit like that like I am, I will give a review next week. Hey, sounds good. You know what else sounds kind of... Uh, I shouldn't... That's not even a good segue. You know what else sounds good? 
it, it doesn't necessarily sound good. It sounds interesting. Did you know they were going to make more Legally Blonde stuff? I want to say that we talked, we had a hint a while back and we talked about it, but we didn't have anything major. Well, it turns out they're moving forward fast with this prequel series. And uh, yeah, check it out. That's what headline number six is here. Our final headline of the show, mind you. Six, six, six. Legally Blonde prequel series sets opening casting call for young Ellie Woods. This comes to us from Variety.com. L. Woods. Thank you, L. Woods. No objections here. The Legally Blonde prequel series at um, Amazon Prime Video is putting out an open casting call for the series' lead role. Reese Witherspoon made the announcement on her Instagram on Wednesday. Our search for the high school version of L. Woods is officially on. Witherspoon wrote in the post. With our friends at Prime Video, we're making the casting process totally open. So you can submit your auditions at the link in her in my bio. I'm so excited to see all your fabulous takes on everyone's famous uh, favorite Gemini vegetarian. And that is actually why we are discussing this today is because, uh, you know, I, I have no problem with this film. It's okay. But the reason why we're talking about it is because it is an open casting call. That means anybody, you listening, your niece or whatever, if yeah. she wants to, if you think, oh, you could be a good young Reese Witherspoon, anyone could audition. This is like, this is one of those dream come true scenarios for someone out there. Who knows who, who opens the chocolate bar and gets the golden ticket. But the mere fact that you get a chance, that's kind of fun. I, I obviously, that doesn't help me at all being a 37 year old man, but I hope someone out there's dream comes true. <laughs> <laughs> but can you imagine there's gotta be at least a couple weirdos who are going to like enter it, who are just not like, like a really over the weight, completely different race, like male, just being like, I'm going to go for it. Maybe yeah. they'll see past this outer visage. If he can put it out, if he can sell it, I'll buy it. <laughs> you know what? I would love to watch those weird auditions. Like, uh, just the, the most obscure, like strangest people who come in to audition for things. That would be fun. You know uh, I'm Actually, sure they I have that kind of crap on like the boy, like, right. Like all those things where it's just really bad. I do kind of take that back now that I think about it. Cause all the auditions I've run, I don't, you, you get tired and you want to just see people who know what they're doing. So maybe, maybe it would have bad flashbacks. That's a good point. That's a good point. Back to Legally Blonde. They made a weird... Uh, hold on, though. They made a weird third one called Legally Blondes. Hmm. Yeah. She produced, so... Some validity to it? I mean, it's legal. That was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> the prequel was officially ordered at Prime Video back in May. Currently titled L. The logline for the series states that it follows Elle Woods in high school as we learn about the life experiences that shaped her into the iconic young woman we came to know and love in the first Legally Blonde film. The series hails from creator Laura Kittrell, who will also serve as showrunner and executive producer. Witherspoon executive produces, along with Lauren Neustadter, via Hello Sunshine, a part of Candle Media. Lauren Kizilevsky and Mark Platt will also executive produce. <laughs> Amazon MGM Studios will also produce. A lot of producers, a lot of producers. So a lot of people are behind this, so I mean... I, you know what? Anyone who's excited for this, great. And I do, like I said, we did, we're doing this so because it's an open cast call and we think we should put the word out, but I don't know what story there is, because the whole point is she was kind of like, uh, I don't mean to misrepresent if I'm wrong, but she was kind of like a blondie, kind of like prom queen maybe not airhead, but kind of like vamp and shallow chick. And she it's like goes, an origin story. Yeah, and she goes to law school, right? And she becomes a better person. So what does the show going to tell us? Like, this is, is she going to start out nerdy and then get like vampid and weird and blonde? And that, that I, could be a thing, but I feel like that's been done. I want I her to come in as story. herself. I want him to completely change it. I want to go and have it just be like, like, did you know in high school? She actually was like a detective. It was like a Nancy Drew story. Completely flip it on its head. I don't know. But like, I I just, I don't think this is needed. 
I'd rather see if they were going to do something, a Legally Blonde 3, where she's like in her 40s dealing with some real shit in life. Yeah, but I mean, hey, if you want to try it, so go on to uh, Reef <laughs> Witherspoon's uh, Twitter, and she says, literally, she has the, uh, you can submit your auditions at the link in her bio. So if you want to try, if you know someone who you think would fit that role, that's how you can do it. Ryan, I think we should both do it. And we'll record it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. I'm down. I'm, We're going to have to watch it again because I, I don't know. I'm going to adosh, a, audition for Young El Woods. Honestly, I think you've got a good chance, man. I don't. <laughs> but you know what would be funny is if they were trying to be so politically correct they casted me. Oh, no. That would, that would be interesting. I would, I would be like, oh, no, what do you do now? <laughs> like, what have I done? Be like, all right, let me think about this. There's a lot of possible. There's a lot of ways this can go. Is is it? Oh, you don't you don't want to go down that road. Yeah, we're already down it now. Here oh. we go. Uh, so you know what? That brings us to the end of the show. No. But it is October first. It is officially October, the spooky season, and some other news concerning all you Earthlings out there is at the uh, not now. Three shows from now, the fourth week, still October, of every month, we are introducing a new section in the entertainment part of the show, where every four weeks we are doing a Tattered Tales. Yeah. Now, Tattered Tales, for those of you who do not know, is a bit like The Twilight Zone or uh, Tales from the Crypt. It is an audio drama, usually between 10 and 25 minutes, no longer than that, but it's an original audio drama of spookiness or weirdness or fantasy. It's an anthology, so the stories are always self-contained and they're a lot of fun. All, most of the time written by me, but we have a few other writers that will obviously be credited for their episode, and it's uh, actors, sound effects, music, the whole shabeel. And uh, the one this month is going to be starring yours truly. And uh, Joe and, and his whole team, they do such a great job with it. There's music. There's, you know, there's sounds. Like, it, you really feel like it's, like... It's immersive, if think, you will. Yeah, think think Tales from the Crypt meets Twilight Zone. Maybe maybe a smidge of Black Mirror. I don't know. Like, it, it, Fair each, enough. each episode is its own thing. Like you said, it's really sweet. It is. And that episode is, of course, called Num 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 Num. I'm a house. That's right. <laughs> it is. That's the name. That is the name. Uh, so yeah, guys, beyond that, just a reminder that, uh, if you want to help out, support the show, all you need to do is download this episode, download the episode, wherever you listen to this podcast, whether it be Spotify, Apple podcast, even audible, you know what? Nothing is stopping you from downloading it on multiple (laughs) platforms. Vote once, vote twice, vote often as they used to say in Chicago. Why not? (laughs) And your mission should you choose to accept it, share this podcast with a coworker, with a friend, with a loved one, with a fellow Earthling. Show it to an enemy. Why not? Why I'm just not? saying. I once heard that they used to torture people by putting them in a room and replaying the same media over and over and over again. So if you have an enemy that you really, really want to mess with, this might do it. Who knows? I, I'm not saying you should torture anyone. I'm just saying you should download the episode. And what you do with the episode at that point is up to you, and we claim no responsibility for it. And this has <laughs> been episode 57. 57. Holy moly. And, you know, we're getting more Earthlings listening every day. And thank you guys so much. If Fuck you yeah. want a uh, free sticker, we got these great stickers. They're like, we do. They're like five inch by three inch stickers. They're uh, they're bumper sticker quality, so you could put them outside. They're waterproof. They, they're, they're guaranteed for up to seven years in outside weather. And they spread the word. They do. They are Earthling Entertainment logo stickers. And to obtain one or two of these stickers, depending on our supplies, <laughs> all you have to do is email us with a mailing address to Earthling Entertainment Podcast at gmail.com. And that's it. Search us. We're on Twitter. We are on Instagram. Uh, Instagram. We are also on uh, TikTok as well. Yeah. We, as uh, Earthling Entment. <laughs> because wow. Because you couldn't fit entertainment. Oh, so fair en- enough. Entment is the shortening for entertainment. Huh. Choices. 
It's a thing. We've made choices here. I did. Uh, you could also, if you have a Facebook, we're very active on that Facebook page. And in fact, if you want to message us there, you can. Otherwise, like I said, Earthling Entertainment Podcast at gmail.com. Best way. Thank you all so much for listening. We we love doing the show. Next week, Tuesday, same time, same, same place. And wow. uh, yeah, from all of us here at Earthling Entertainment, see ya. Goodbye. Thank you.